They were at two hundred and forty-five thousand uh, dollars. They had priced it roughly fifty grand under the comps because it needed about fifty grand of one of the units was uh, occupied. And over the course of about a year, we put sixty something thousand dollars into it, turned both units over. Now they're renting, you know, sixteen, seventeen hundred bucks a piece, and you know. The properties. Hi everybody, Jose Luis Morales here. Welcome back to another episode of the Morales Report. Today we have Hans uh, Struzina. He's from the Bay Area, California, and today he is going to be talking to us about how to invest in small multifamily rentals. We're going to be talking about how to buy duplexes. We're going to talk about how to buy triplets, fourplex, uh, sixplex, including. Welcome to the show, Hans. How are you? Jose, thanks for having me on. I'm well. I love it. I love it. So for our viewers that don't know who you are, who is Hans Struzina? And then how did you get involved in this wonderful world of buying small multifamily rentals? Yeah. Uh, so going back, I, uh, in a previous career, because I've already, this is really my second career, uh, I was a full-time athlete, amateur, underscore highlighted, where I didn't make any money doing it because I was a rower. Uh, I've spent 12 years pursuing a passion there from high school all the way to the Olympics. So I uh, sort of my crowning achievement athletically was competing in the Rio de Janeiro uh, 2016 Olympics for Team USA in the men's eight and uh, was was, a, like I said, a 12 year career. Uh, I I always thought I would be involved in real estate. I, I thought more maybe on the commercial side, mostly because my family, I've got a real estate attorney, a couple of real estate developers. I've got different people in my life who are involved in that side of the business. Um, but I ended up having a mentor early on who was a supporter of mine during my time rowing. Uh, who was a broker, who did a lot of REO stuff, who was doing some flips and different things like that down in the San Diego market, offered me an opportunity to get my license, go hang it under him, learn that side of the business, and potentially stay flexible enough that, to keep training if I wanted to. I ultimately did not. I, I retired after 2016 and just found that I really had a passion for and a, and a desire for the residential side, which uh, once I started having some success there, um, spent a lot of time learning about not only this, that sales, but also, you know, underwriting small multifamily, uh, brought my wife into it. She now is actually an agent with me as well. So we're a, a small team here in the Bay Area. But um, ultimately, we realized like you, you start making some money, you want to start putting some of your skills to use for yourself, not just your clients. So we ended up starting to invest in small multifamily and are starting to scale that portfolio up a bit. Love it. Congratulations. So walk us through the first uh, apartment that you ever uh, purchased. Where was that located? What did you buy it at? Uh, how did you finance it? And then uh, what does it look like now? Yeah, so I grew up in the Seattle, Washington area. I moved down here over a decade ago for rowing and then have stayed. Uh, so we were looking locally because we thought we wanted a house hack and, and live in one unit, rent the other out kind of thing. But what we could afford at the time was not something that we wanted to live in. So uh, we ended up going farther and farther out. We went to Sacramento, Central Valley. We started looking at, you know, as far as Kansas City at one point and realized that simply uh, an Airbnb, a car rental, and a flight there and back was going to eat half a year of cash flow. So I said, okay, where do we go anyways that, you know, we can start to like write off an annual trip, uh, look at real estate, do real estate stuff, and do our trip on top of that. So uh, we realized we'd go back to Seattle, Washington, two, three, four times a year, see my family. That's let's Let's go look. And so I, all of a sudden, this light bulb hit me. Tacoma was going to be a perfect place for this. It was about 50 minutes outside of Seattle. Uh, hadn't, wasn't a really nice place when I was growing up, has gotten a lot nicer since, uh, but was an area that we could afford. The rents were solid uh, and had enough uh, product for us that we could, we could find something that we wanted. So the property we ended up buying the first time in 2018 was one that was sitting on the market for about nine or 10 months. They were at two hundred and forty-five thousand uh, dollars. 
Uh, they had priced it roughly 50 grand under the comps because it needed about 50 grand of work. So the sellers, you know, strategically just did that and no one wanted it. And so we come along and we're like, okay, 245, you can rent it for, you know, 11, 1200 aside. We put in a few bucks into these units. Um, yeah, this works, this hits our numbers. And this was probably the 30 or 35th deal that we had underwritten in Tacoma by then. So this wasn't by any means the first thing we looked at, but we realized that there was an opportunity there to force some appreciation, to uh, buy it at a reasonable price and get some cash flow like we wanted. So uh, we put in our offer and we went for it. Um, it was a, just a standard 30 year fix, 25% down at the time. Uh, and we ended up getting one of the units emptied. One of the units was uh, occupied. And over the course of about a year, we put 60 something thousand dollars into it, turned both units over. Uh, and now they're renting, you know, 16, 1700 bucks a piece. Uh, and, you know, the property is doing it's it's at least doubled in value since the time we bought it or pretty darn close. Maybe it's come down a little bit from it from a peak last year, but it's doing incredibly well. How much positive cash flow were you guys making when you guys first bought it? Approximately. We were, tr yeah, we were trying to get to a net of about 200 bucks a door, which we were just hitting when we bought it. Um, since then, we we did a burr strategy. So buy, uh, rehab, refinance, uh, repeat. And so we, we ended up, because interest rates were, uh, lower and the appreciation was going up. So we ended up borrow taking a bigger loan, having a, a slightly lower interest rate. The payment was, I think it was what within a hundred dollars of what we were paying the first time. Um, but we ended up pulling 60 grand off the table. So that point we were starting to get about 200, 250 bucks. Now we're getting almost a grand of, of net positive cash flow out of that unit or out of those two units um, in, in total, just because the market has gone up so much for the, that type of rental. I love it. At that time when you bought the rental, considering it was the first one, did you factor in any rent appreciation or any uh, future appreciation over time in your original formula? Cause I know I did it when I first uh, started buying real estate. And then when it, yeah. came, I was like, Oh my God, like I didn't realize that rents go up over time and that also values mm -hmm. go up over time. And those are all things I would just look at it from a cash flow. How much did I invest? How much positive cash flow am I making? Yeah, that that's more or less what we did as well. Uh, because I mean, I would say we're relatively conservative people. And when you're starting something brand new, that's what it, you don't know what you don't know. Right. Yeah. So, so we just ran the basic pro forma and looked at it more or less in a moment in time didn't factor in any appreciation, although we knew there would be some didn't factor in, you know, time value of money for 10 year hold of appreciation slash rent rental growth. Um, but just knew that there was going to be positive cash flow of, you know, about 400 bucks total, uh, that hit our minimum threshold that we wanted. And we felt like, you know, you would get better from there, but at worst case scenario, it was going to be that. And so that's, it, it that's about as far as we took it and realized that, you know, at some point you got to pull the trigger and do your first one. And we just went for it. And I'm sure glad we did. I love it. So why did you decide to buy in uh, Seattle versus the Bay area? Like from a numbers perspective, like what would have been the alternative if you would have bought in the Bay area? Would you have found something that cash flowed or no? Uh, you can find those. They're harder to find. The main reason we stayed away, uh, well, was number one, we we didn't like what we could afford. It was not; those were not nice areas, and those were not types of units and tenant bases that we wanted to uh, yeah. to to invest with. And so, um, since then, and at the time, rent control and tenant law and all that was 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 skewed towards the tenant, uh, and it had only gotten more aggressive. And so there's certainly, you know, you can make money and you can have a good solid investment inside of those rules. But for us, we, we just didn't want to do that. Uh, didn't want to learn it. Didn't want to be subject to it. 
And in retrospect, I'm glad because COVID got really tenant friendly around here. And uh, I have a couple of listings where we have tenants in place and it is, it is uh, not very fun dealing with those, those types of properties right now. Got it. Um, what type of prop, uh, what does your strategy look like now? Like, are you looking for your properties on the market? Are you finding them off market? Are you still in the Seattle area? Have you shifted somewhere else? What does that look like? Yeah. So, uh, the, the strategy is simply continue to underwrite as many deals as we can on or off market. We have made offers and gotten uh, LOIs accepted on larger buildings, on smaller buildings, um, because we're just continuing to run property regardless of where it comes from through our through our calculators. And um, we found all but one of our properties on market. Generally, they're properties that are sort of overlooked. They've got some funk on them. They've got a neglectful landlord or... or neglectful is a strong word, got someone who's not paying attention. Um, and someone who, you know, and maybe there's a weird floor plan or there's something going on there that just is like, people are passing it over. And so, uh, we ended up buying a second property in Tacoma. And by the time we were ready for a third, the, uh, market had appreciated so much that cash flow was really hard to come by. So we ended up getting out of there, going to Ohio at the uh, advice of our current real or our real estate agent from Seattle. And we ended up now buying our four or in contract on our fourth property out in the Ohio area. And um, this one currently is an off market deal, but all the rest of them have been on market and just frankly sort of overlooked by people for one reason or another. Got it. Congratulations on that. What are the inputs that you put in your uh, calculator? Like, what are some of the things that you input on there? And then what do you look at when selecting the right properties? And what do you look for in, in a property? Yeah, that's changed over time. The inputs are rent, obviously, and then uh, any any potential for additional, um, you know, income, laundry, parking, storage, stuff like that. Uh, and then we uh, have to make some assumptions on operating expenses like utilities, because most of those types of properties in Ohio, or at least in the Cleveland area, landlord pays water, sewer, garbage, tenants pay gas, electric, and then cable and internet. And, and so we're looking at that. We're also budgeting for you know, 5% CapEx, 5% repairs and maintenance, roughly 10% for property management. Uh, so we're making, we're, we're building a buffer into that. And then obviously you've got your taxes, your insurance and insurance, as everyone knows, is not the easiest thing to come by for certain properties. So you can't just phone that one in anymore. Um, but we're, we're doing as much diligence as we can. We're making some assumptions on those things. And then if it still hits our minimum threshold cash flow wise, then it's like, okay, we did our first round. Now we're going to do a deep dive. And then we want to know, is the, is the injection, is it like, does it need a new roof? Are the furnace, what condition of the furnace is in? Uh, do we need to go buy an air conditioner, whatever. And so um, then we're starting to look at actual investment in the property and then, you know, looking at, then it's just simple numbers like cash on cash return at that point. And then the other thing that we've learned sort of through the school of hard knocks is the location matters significantly in the, in the sense that the type of tenant that you attract makes a really big difference. So we don't live in Ohio. We're three time zones away. And We've bought, you know, in a play in a town called Euclid, we've bought in a town called uh, Cleveland Heights, and now we're in a town called Lakewood. So none of that's Cleveland proper, but those are all within, you know, 15 minutes of Cleveland. And um, what we've found is the type of tenant who wants to live in a place like Euclid versus Cleveland Heights versus Lakewood are very, very different people. You've got, you know, s some people who don't have, you know, uh, Venmo on their phone or don't do, don't have a phone for whatever reason. And then you've got people who are very tech friendly and, and we're finding that certain pockets attract certain types of people. And for us as out of state landlords, obviously having those sort of 
uh, virtual communication and being able to direct deposit or use your phone and text or fill out a, uh, something online <clears throat> makes a huge difference. So that's something that we're really underwriting specifically is who's there, who, what's the tenant base, how tech friendly are they? Um, how responsive are they? Stuff like that. And that other than just like, can they afford the rent? Because that headache is, is big in some cases. What, have, what mistakes have you guys made, uh, obviously, in growing a portfolio? Um, gosh, uh, property managers are really, really hard to pick. I think everyone has at least one good, you know, I fired my property manager story. We've, we've been through about four or five of them. Um, I think that the biggest thing, uh, one of the biggest mistakes we made was, was real... Uh, underestimating how much capital certain projects were going to need or certain properties were going to need and what that would do to our yearly projections. Um, cause you know, we're technically negative on a couple of properties this year because of how much we had to put in. Um, it was in the model, but it like, it starts to hurt pretty significantly when you, when you realize, oh, there was actually an extra 12 here and eight here and that sort of thing. So I think we realized that, underestimating those capital injections was a, was and is a mistake. Um, we did, and we continue to manage some of the properties ourselves because they're, some of them are fairly self-sufficient, but we always manage, or we always underwrite for a property manager. And we want to make sure that at some point we're going to hand this off to somebody and, uh, we don't want to, you know, be, we want to be able to afford that person. And so I think that's a, a mistake that some people make. And then I think the, the other one is the, the other pain that we've kind of gone through is, is if you fall in love with something, you know, emotionally get attached to it, um, then you might overlook something. So for example, we've got a property where they built out the attic into a third unit. Um, but somehow we, we didn't realize that it wasn't, uh, legalized. And so now we're having to go through the process of legalizing that unit, which will ultimately add value to the property. But it was an unforeseen thing. We got excited about the location. So we, we sort of had our blinders on to that fact. And it's luckily not going to torpedo anything, but falling in love with, with something before you own it <laughs> can be another mistake. And we, we've certainly been guilty of that too. I love it. What type of ROI or cash on cash you, you, do you look at and which one do you measure? Do you measure like return on investment, cash on cash? What are you looking for? Yeah, we're, we're always looking at the cash on cash, meaning the dollars that have gone into the property through closing costs, down payments, in, uh, capital injections. Uh, so we're always looking at that. I mean, I want that number to be 10% plus. And, you know, there are uh, certainly times when we're well exceeding that. And then there are certainly times when we've been below that. Um, you know, in the beginning, it was really simple. It's like, can we get to, uh, you know, 200 bucks net a door? That was sort of the first model. And then it started to evolve from that. And, and now we're starting to be a lot more picky of like, from not only from like a long-term hold standpoint, but also a, uh, a standpoint of, you know, what kind of exits could we make out of this property? Um, is there more than just operate it, get the balance sheet going and sell it? Could we develop it? Could we add another unit? Could we uh, add parking and really make it worth more money? Could we subdivide the, the property and, and sell them off individually? Stuff like that so that we're starting to get into and looking at different different ways to move through the deal that aren't just as straightforward as like buy it, collect rents, sell it someday. Got it. I love it. Okay, cool. Um, what, uh, tell us about the property that you're looking at right now. You, I think you said that you're under contract on a six unit, right? Um, how does a six That's unit right. differ from anything that you've bought before from like a duplex, a triplex and a fourplex? Yeah. So this one is, it's pretty cool. It's a, it's, it's six townhouse style, uh, condos or apartments right next to each other. Are you in love they with all it share. Right now? What's that? Are you in love with it right now? This, I'm just kidding. 
I'm not. Uh, I am from the sense that I love I love what it is and what it can be. Um, it is it's it's probably of all the stuff that we own. It's probably my favorite uh, configuration thus far. Yeah, I'll put it that way. And the reason I love it is because it's three bedrooms up with a bathroom. Main mm. level's got the kitchen and dining room, uh, an entryway, and they've all got their own individual basements. They're all individually metered. They've got their own utilities. <clears throat> and a, a bunch of parking in the back. And the thing that I love about that, in, and we've done some diligence on this, is we're, uh, we believe that there's a world where we can sort of condo convert these and sell them off individually down the road. We'd obviously have to go through surveyors and, you know, the city planning department and so forth. But, you know, it looks like you could sell each one of these little condos for like 250 260 um, which puts you know, all six of them at like a million five or so. Uh, and we're getting this thing for around, you know, low eight hundreds. Um, so there's a pretty nice spread to be made there too. So that's part of why I really love that. Um, the other one is that type of property is something that, uh, attracts a lot of different folks who, who, you know, from young people, first job with a roommate, it's perfect for, you know, families can live in there and there's a strong school district that this one's located in. And then, um, you know, you've even got sort of potentially, I guess, downsize types who could go in there too. So it's got a broad tenant base for something like this because it functions sort of like its own single family setup. I love it. I love it. So, um, so for that reason, I love it. <laughs> no, it's, it sounds like a really good um, property. Um, how does the fi like the financing vary from a six unit to these other properties? Yeah, I mean, you click over into commercial financing once you go go to five or more. Um, so the underwriting is different. the um, the The way that the lender is going to look at the at the debt and at the the building is going to be very different. They're <clears throat> they're not just looking at you as a borrower. They're looking at the financials of the property. They're looking at, um, you know, how can it get a debt coverage ratio of a certain amount or more? So they're, they're looking at sort of it as a business, but also you as a borrower. And in that case, you can start to potentially talk about non-recourse debt, which we are not currently because of what this thing qualifies for. Um, but it's, it's just a totally different, uh, ball game. Uh, what we've looked at in the past is, you know, a lot more 35 to 40% down product, uh, which is pretty standard in this, when you start to get into commercial world, especially with rates being where they're at. We, we did some shopping around and we found someone who was able to do something which I haven't heard of yet, which is pretty great. It's, uh, we've got a 25 year amortization, five year balloon. And it's a 20% down and a 6.18% interest rate, uh, which I haven't found anyone who's been able to come close to that. So obviously we're going to have to do, do a move on this within five years, but um, to get into it and have the ability to potentially subdivide and get out of it a, a couple of different ways, we're pretty excited about, about that debt structure. I love it. I love it. Um, good. So why focus on duplex, triplex, fourplex, sixplex versus 20, 30, 40, 100 units? Yeah. Um, there's a headache factor and a noise factor that we, that we are looking at right now. Um, the first, when it started, it was just like, that's what we could afford. That's what we were comfortable with, especially doing it from afar. Um, then it was, then we started to get, you know, pretty competent at this, uh, and feeling, feeling good about it. So, um, we've just in the last 12 months really started to set our sights on bigger properties. Uh, the thing that we're running into is, you know, the ones that we have looked at just don't pencil and I don't want to be, you know, feeding a, you know, two to $5 million building right now, given the way the economy is that just, I didn't, I we penciled too many that we were going to have to send a couple thousand bucks into every month. And I just didn't want to do that. <clears throat> On top of that, you know, our brokerage business has been really strong the last, you know, 30 months or so. 
and there's there's an element of you got to <clears throat> excuse me you got to make a decision on where you put your time and how much of it you put here versus there and our profitability especially in the last 18 to 24 months selling houses has been incredibly high um, so we didn't want to take a ton of time away distracting to try to set up a 50 unit building uh, and learn that while the brokerage business was going so well. Um, you know, things have certainly slowed down. I think we're going to, we are still going to beat our 2021 numbers. We probably won't quite get to 2022 numbers, but we're going to be close um, this year. But I think that there's uh, a factor of, you know, the headache, the time spent, and then certainly there was a, a comfort level and a confidence level that we started to build up. So to, the succinct way to answer your question is we started there just because that's that felt natural and easy and that felt like the right place to start. And now what we're moving towards is is what you s described, that 12, 20, 50 unit world. Uh, we're certainly going in that direction. As a real estate uh, professional, are you receiving any tax incentives from investing in these multifamily properties? Yeah, one of the things we do because we actively manage and we meet uh, the IRS requirements for being an active real estate investor, investor is we are doing uh, what's called a cost segregation. So you can take the depreciation of the property over 27 and a half years and accelerate it. Uh, into a couple years, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now the IRS code changed at the end of 2022, so you can't take all of that in one year anymore. And they're they're moving it to it's like 80 20 this year. It's going to be like 60 60 20 20 the next year, something like that. So it's changing. But what we had done is accelerated the depreciation, uh, took it as an active loss against real estate uh, sales income, <clears throat> and that was. Uh, effectively keeping our tax rate really, really low compared to what it should have been. And it was more or less paying for the down payments for these properties. Got it. I love it. Yeah. So it's funny because I bought a 25 unit in 2019 and we did a cost segregation study and that helped me out more in taxes than anything I'd ever done. And I always wonder like, why didn't my accountant tell me about this? Like, why didn't I like he give me a heads up that I could be saving all this money uh, with this. So even more of a reason to, to buy real estate, especially if you have a California real estate license or if you qualify under the classification of a real estate pro professional. Um, yeah. And I would say if your accountant doesn't understand cost segregation, you need a new accountant if you're going to be doing real estate seriously. Yeah. I agree with you a hundred, a hundred and ten percent on that. Good. Um, what are some things that you guys are looking to uh, change for the future or things that you guys will be implementing or, or, or in other words, like what's the vision? Like how many units do you guys want to have? Um, is there like a certain income goal instead of number of units? What is that? Yeah. Mean? Yeah. That's, that's an interesting question, which isn't, obvious to answer because we're sort of thinking through that for a long time it was a property a year for 10 years with the assumption the first handful would be duplex triplex and then we get into six to ten to twelve to whatever and we'd get to you know 80 100 units at the end of 10 years or something like that um there's a noise factor there's a headache factor with tenants toilets trash etc um, so we're also looking at different investment opportunities that involve things like note investing, uh, hard money lending, you know, some of these other things that don't actually require as, as much hands-on management once you make the initial investment. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and seeing what that might look like and how we might decide to put that into our strategy. Uh, I suspect we're going to continue buying real estate, but, um, you know, there's, there's really only so many hours in the day, as we all know, and it's hard to, it's, it's, you have to make a decision on where you spend your time. And, and that's something we're looking at right now is to like, okay, what kind of lifestyle do we want? What kind of uh, income needs to support that lifestyle? And then what kind of growth do we want beyond that? And, and so, you know, if you asked me 18 months ago, I'd say like, let's get to like, 
a hundred units or something. Now I'm looking more of like, how do I buy some of my time back? How do we, how do we reduce the noise on a day-to-day basis so we can start spending our time, you know, on, on investments or business opportunities or uh, personal op- things that we want to do and not have to worry about the day-to-day hustle of, you know, some of either the sales game or, you know, tenant landlord stuff. How, how much time does it take to manage 11 units at a state? Well, uh, the IRS says we need to spend at least a hundred to be uh, an, a minimum, you know, real estate investor. I mean, we surely, I mean, we spend at least more than, you know, I think we each spend a hundred hours a year. It feels like uh, me and my wife, but um, you can be pretty streamlined. Uh, we do visit our properties. So obviously those count towards your hundred. Um, we do go, you know, we, we just did a, you know, flew to Cleveland, spent a ton of time in Cleveland looking at that unit uh, with the inspectors and walking it and all that stuff. So those count. But, um, you know, in general, it can be relatively st- streamlined if you have, you know, your online payments, your, you have a VA who can help you manage your books and your processes and your tenant turnover requests and all those sorts of things. So it, it doesn't have to be, you know, hundreds or thousands of hours a year. Um, but it certainly can be if you want it to be. I think we're spending, you know, a couple hundred hours combined per year. Got it. What are some of the challenges that come up on a day-to-day basis from investing out of the area? Um, the main ones is having, it, it all sort of comes back to people and, and having or not having the right relationships on the ground. So, uh, we've gone through a handful of property managers, um, which just didn't meet our operating style or our communication style for one reason or another. And, um, when you find like, and then finding the people who you can trust, the electricians, the handymen, the roofers, whomever, um, that takes a lot of time to a find B vet and C build those relationships. So it's, it's, it's all sort of back to that. Like if you have the right people there physically, you can pretty much do anything you want and you can, and, and it doesn't have to be a huge, uh, challenging issue, but, um, not having those relationships is absolutely the hardest thing. Cause if a toilet breaks, you're just calling the first person that'll pick up versus if you've got your person who knows what to do, they can just take it and handle it and run with it. Yeah. What are some tips for finding the right relationships or finding the right people in an area where maybe you're investing for the first time? I mean, there's all the online review sites. I think that those are great. Uh, I think that if you, you got to deep dive some of those, you got to call and actually pick up the phone and talk to some of these people live. And at a certain point, you got to hire somebody and you got to put out a you know, you just got to see how they perform and see how they communicate. And if they do an okay job, but they don't follow up, then, you know, that might not be your person forever. I, there is a, there is a trial and error part of this that is just impossible to ignore or to, to avoid, but ideally, you know, your real estate agent, your lender, your property manager, a contractor, those types of people can you know, either refer each other or kind of be checks and balances with one another. And, and those, those people can keep you uh, sort of moving forward. And hopefully um, through some iteration, you'll find the right combination of those, those relationships. Um, So frankly, I just don't think that there is a magic pill to it. I think you just got to pick up the phone and call people. You got to you know, go meet people when you're in town and make an effort to, you know, pay people on time, communicate effectively, thank them for their work, and then continue to give them work if they if they show up for you in the right way. I love it. I love it. Any final tips for somebody looking to get into the uh, buying of duplex, triplex, fourplex, or smaller multifamily uh, deals? I think at the end of the day, uh, Number one is you got to underwrite a bunch of properties. Like if you're not underwriting at least 30 before you put your first offer and you're probably not underwriting enough. Mm -hmm. Um, When a deal shows up on the MLS or off market, wherever you find it, you should be able to look at it pretty quickly and figure out, oh, this is way better than anything I've seen recently. 
Um, and that only comes through reps. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is once you find that property, don't be afraid to pull the trigger, um, especially if you're in an area that has uh, culturally you can get away with getting an inspection contingency on it. Um, you know, do your diligence, take it step by step, because, um, you know, the only way to sort of build that confidence is going to be to start and then to actually close on that first one and then know that that first one's not going to be your retirement plan. Hope it'll probably be part of it, but it's not going to be the the end all be all deal that you ever do in your life. Got it. Okay, cool, man. And then if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, you can uh, hop onto our website. Um, you can contact us through that. It's it's our real estate uh, brokerage website. So so you'll see all of our real estate sales stuff there, but that takes you right to us. Um, it's hansandkristin.com. That's H-A-N-S and K-R-I-S-T-I-N.com. I love it, man. Well, I want to say thank you, Hans, for taking the time to come on the show. I appreciate, obviously, you sharing um, on how to buy smaller apartment complexes um for our viewers out there if you've enjoyed this episode uh today we had hans struzina he talked about about how to invest in small multifamily rentals if you've enjoyed this episode make sure to hit that subscribe button if you feel that this episode would be helpful to somebody make sure to hit that share button uh thanks again to our viewers hans thanks again and then until next time guys